Today is Friday, June 16th, 2023, and you're listening to the Ask a Christian Podcast. I'm your host, Nate. Hmm, this may be the quietest I've ever been. I, uh, I do a lot of listening today. Maybe we'll learn something. Maybe I'll learn something. Maybe I did learn something. Maybe you'll learn something. Listen for more. We talk about uh, some of the normal stuff to start us off, faith versus works. Some people share their testimony, including Pastor Sam, our guest, our friend, um, so you get a little bit more of the, a uh, little bit more of a church service uh, setting for the first little bit. Then uh, we have someone to uh, to put a nail in that point, and we talk about did Jesus or the Holy Spirit create stuff? Despite what the Bible says, point blank, black and white, multiple locations in the Bible, Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the one that all things were made through. He sustains all things. Jesus, not the Holy Spirit. So we talk about that, um, then we turn out this guy is like, I don't even know if he's a cult, um, he, he's like the only member of it, but he believes like, I don't know, the Holy Spirit's a woman too, or something like that, it's crazy. Anyway, so the answer is, Jesus created stuff. Um, there's there's no way to get around that. And we, we talk a little bit, I go on a rant, it's like how, how, you know, people say, when they ask a very obscure question about like, the Bible, that has nothing to do with Jesus or salvation, it's just like about a very obscure topic, and the Bible doesn't really have much to say about it because it doesn't matter, and they're like, oh, if your Bible doesn't talk about this ad nauseum, how do you possibly know, how can your God be true? I'm like, what? I'm like, none of this matters. Like, let's talk about the stuff that matters, the Bible has plenty to say about that. And then, we have a guy, I mean, this happened yesterday, and today we have this guy asking something like this, where the Bible says plenty about it, like, you'll hear tons about it um all through the bible and he's like oh okay well no it doesn't (laughs) i'm like what you're saying it doesn't say what it says um so without saying it's saying it doesn't say what it says he says it doesn't say what it says um (laughs) so that's um i don't know a little irritating but still needs jesus then we talk about prophecies versus prophets and you know if there was a ranking system somehow is does prophet beat priest um, or preacher. Anyway, so uh, we talk about that and then the difference in prophecies and prophets and the office and the calling or gifting or whatever. We talk about all of that. And then there's uh, some more questions. And largely, I am a listener today. So I don't know, maybe it's because I have work going on because I'm, I'm like multitasking. Um, whatever the reason, it's a good discussion. I uh, learned some stuff and it was enjoyable. Did I sell that well? All right. So check out the Ask a Christian book on Amazon, free to read with the Kindle Unlimited subscription. Check out the Ask a Christian store, grab a t-shirt, support this broadcast, and you can click on the donate link to help us financially that way. It is much appreciated. Um, Share these links on social media, and we'll see you... Oh, it's the weekend, right? I'm off. All right, peace out. We'll see you Monday. Bye. But are not saved. So now I would like to know, how do we know when someone is saved? What's the telltale signs of someone being saved? I would like to know that. Help yeah, me. right. That that's pretty important. Like you don't think about that. Like I took that for granted too. Like you know, if you have a pastor, they're going to be safe. But <laughs> um, you know, off the top of my head, I'm thinking like listen to their, you know, altar call or when they share the gospel or whatever. Um, and, and listen to what they say. Like, are they parroting what the Bible says? Like, do they have a good handle on what the gospel is? I mean, that doesn't speak to their heart. But uh, you know, if they, I mean, if they talk about the gospel and you know say well just believe in jesus and you know do good stuff and be like ooh, i don't know if they have an incorrecting of understanding of the gospel or i mean how can they be saved if that's what they really think um but you know if they have a really scriptural detailed laying out of the gospel and what that is and what that means well at least you know they know it because they said it uh so i think there's a better chance that they they believe it and then you know we, we look at their fruits we look at their you know what they do and see if it lines up with what they just said so i mean you know we'll never know for sure but um, I think, well, you know, by, by their fruits, we'll know them. And then if they give a, a very clear, good, succinct gospel presentation to, to show that they actually know what it is, um, you know, I'd go to that church. Yeah, the, the apostle said, you know, we, um, man, how's it go? Um, for some whose works follow uh, in, in one of the Timothy's. I can't remember the numbers. Forgive me on that. Uh, but John wrote in chapter three of his epistle, First John three. Um, uh, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. We have a particular or 
each other that doesn't come from our uh, just us being natural humans. We love to be around other Christians. We love to make sure that the other Christians are okay. Uh, that we we love the brethren, you know. Uh, and it, you can just see it. You can sense it. You know when you when you come across true believers, it just has a they have a different. Uh, attitude about them discerning other believers. Don't we even have to necessarily be in the same denomination or the same church? But you'd be like, yeah, okay. When you have a conversation with them, you 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 can sense the joy of the Lord in their heart, and you, yeah, you'd be like, yeah, that's just some discernment. But that's what it says in the word. We perceive hereby perceive we the love of God because He laid down our lives for us, and we ought to also lay down our lives for the brethren. That that kind of thing. I'm just saying. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. You know, when I think about that, uh, who's saved today? You know, it takes me back to uh, what is written in uh, many different passages of Scripture. For example, Ephesians two and eight, where Paul says, "For by grace are ye saved through faith." And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast going off into that verse, that ninth verse. And then taking a look at verse 10, trying to remember what he says there. For we are his workmanship created, uh, uh, what does he say, uh, in Christ Jesus, unto good works, I believe that he says, if I'm not mistaken, that he before ordained, ordered that we should walk in them. That eighth verse says a lot to me um, concerning someone being saved again for by grace are ye saved through faith uh, the man and woman who continues to walk by faith uh, shows the telltale sign that they are saved uh, the evidence of the fruit of the spirit in the life of the individual uh, makes itself known also too when one is operating in uh, holiness, being moved, I believe, by the Holy Spirit, and you guys can correct me on that. That's what I believe when someone is holy, whenever that person is used and moved by the Holy Spirit, the vessel becomes sacred to be used by that which is holy and planted in them. I might be wrong on that, but still learn it. But that's just it, you know, faith, shows the telltale sign of those who are saved, true saving faith, that is, true sound saving faith. Man, I hate to feel like I'm talking a lot, but I am. Uh, that's good stuff. Uh, no, Detroit. preach, man, preach. That's, that's good stuff right there, bro, because I, cause that, 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 those three verses that you read, uh, I don't know if you paid attention. They said exactly what you said. We're saved by grace, but it said that we were ordained to good works. <laughs> you, 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 the very thing that you said, that, that's what he's saying. He's like, okay, we're, we're saved by grace through faith. That not of ourselves. It, it is the gift of God, right? But it says, not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship. We are his, we have been crafted after his mind, after his will. His spirit lives in us. And it says his workmanship created in Christ, watch this, unto good works. We're not saved because of good works, but we were ordained to good works. And the, the caveat is he said, ordained that we should walk in them. I don't there I don't see how that being actually having the true encounter with Christ, being ordained to good works, and the person not not walking what God has ordained. Who's stronger than God? I rest. Yeah. So my interpretation, right, and we can bring up James, faith without works is dead. And Pastor, what I'm getting from what you guys have been saying, you two Detroit, is that we're not justified by God through our works. Um, works, we can be justified by men in our own standing, right? So works has nothing to do with our salvation, right? Abraham was justified before he did any works. 
before he um, sacrificed Isaac, he already had faith to bring Isaac up to Mount Moriah. So a lot of a lot of good stuff that I'm hearing right now. Um, but but what's your take on James? Faith without works is dead. Because I know a lot of Catholics bring it up, right? To use that as a work based system. Well, for, faith faith without works is dead. Is you know that's the truth. It, it's 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 because it's because if what we just read in Ephesians is not taking place, then then you more than likely don't actually have the faith that was delivered to the saints. See, there's a difference between a person, uh, and I'm kind of go, kind of go basic, right? If a person comes to church and he says that they are Christian, they say, I chose Christ, okay? All right, that sounds good on the surface. Because, all right, but why are you choosing Christ? Did you choose Christ because you felt a deep sense of uh, the urgency to flee from sin? Or did you, you know, you're trying to, okay, I, I'm still doing what I want to do, but I'm trying to escape hell, Christian. That, that you know, it's not leading, that the one is not going to lead to the actions of those who have who truly believe one is is going to be a christian because christ has joined them himself to them because he knows their heart because none of us are perfected right you know you, you might catch me on a bad day where i don't look like a christian but god hasn't cast me away and he's still working on me and i'm still Seeking to allow him to, to, to. Well, I saw some, you're cutting out a little. I don't know if you meant to do that or not, but it was kind of choppy. We heard you though. But I mean, I was, I was watching, uh, I was looking at this discussion today and um, it was like some atheist meme and they were making the Christian point, even though I guess they didn't realize it, but it was like, uh, you know, two people, two people, are they making this point? Uh, but it was like two people, you know, one an atheist, one a Christian, pray to God for rain. Um, you know, one uh, prays to God, goes back home, has dinner with his wife. Um, and, you know, the other one goes out and starts plowing the field. Which one, you know, which one really had faith? And they were trying to make a different point, but it failed. But hearing this discussion, it makes that one now. So you could say faith without works is like, well, you know, do you pray to God for rain? And then you don't really expect it's going to happen. So, you know, you don't really have faith. So you just go about your business. Versus, you know, like, um, what did Abraham do? Like, you know, he, he built a boat. God said, build a boat. He built a boat. Or Noah, my bad. But, um, you know, if you pray to God for rain, well, then you start plowing your field, you know, as if it was about to rain. So I, I kind of see that's like faith with works. Like you, you have faith, but then you do practical things. So it doesn't mean you're doing work. It doesn't mean you're doing works to save you. But that would be like faith without works is dead. Like, oh, God, send rain. And then you just go home and, you know, ignore it. And then if it does rain. It's like, oh, well, gosh, I didn't actually expect that prayer to come true. I actually guess I didn't have enough faith. Otherwise, I would have prepared for what I was preparing, uh, praying for. You know, the, 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 the faith of the gospel, it's motivating. This, the, the faith, okay, the faith of the gospel is not our faith. This is a faith that was authored by Christ and given to us, right? And his faith encompasses the love of God. The scripture says, we are a faith working by love. And it says, the love of God constrains us. It's like, your, like our relationships with our wives. We're not in our relationship with, we're not doing things to earn their love. They're not doing things to earn our love. We have a, a co-mutual relation. I want to do this. I want to see you in the morning. I've been married for 36 years, and I still want to see that woman. We don't look the same or, or, or not the same as we were all those many years ago, but the, the, I'm motivated to love her. She's motivated to love me. This is what the faith of the gospel entails for us as believers. We are drawn to God and his purposes and our obedience is, is an outgrowth 
of thankfulness for what he has done for me. Thank you, God. Woo! Man, if you call yourself a believer and you're not thankful for the deliverance from sin and want to lay down your life for him, oh, man. Woo! I'm sorry, I got loose. Hey, Amen. Amen. Uh, looking at that faith, you know, works thing that is mentioned in James chapter two. By the way, awesome, uh, uh, Pastor uh, uh, Sam. Beautiful, man. Uh, you're getting ready to go off into your testimony. Stir a lot of us up in here with that one. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, well, you know, I'm looking at it. Get out here because this, this is getting, boy, <laughs> look, man, you get to thinking, really actually thinking about the love of God and where he brought you from if you had any time in the journey. But I tell you, man, it's been almost 40 years, and it seems like it was just yesterday he introduced himself to me and let me know that this love, whoo, my God, better change your life. I needed him bad. I needed him bad 40 years ago, maybe, and I need him bad now. I still do. I come on, understand people who say that they won't walk away. Where are you going to go? To what? To do what? Because he's so lovely. He's so precious. He's so. Hey, Amen. I, I feel that, Pastor Sale. <laughs> you know, it, it just reminded me of, uh, of an, an experience I had uh, some years ago. You know, and uh, uh, that experience, man, it was powerful. It was, you know. I became very emotional too during that time, you know. And maybe one day I'll share the testimony too. But you know, that faith produces the works. You know, it shows itself. It shows who you belong to, whom we belong to. You know, the faith produces the works shows itself and that's what i believe when we look at that scripture just as the body without the spirit is dead so then faith without works is dead also too isn't that beautiful you know i think about faith as someone mentioned here uh, uh, i believe uh, i don't want to take anything out of context or take any one words run in a different direction with him but i believe that uh, when we look back at the apostle paul in first corinthians 12 he mentions faith as one of the spiritual gifts given to the believer and it is a spiritual gift given to the believer distributed to the believer by way of the holy spirit that god has placed and sealed in us that is so beautiful when i think about that hey i could tear up on that one right there alone come on <laughs> pastor <man>. Sam. Oh. <laughs> that's why he sealed us because the faith that he's given us, it is everlasting. The spirit that he's given us, it is eternal. <laughs> so, so of course, he sealed us unto the day of redemption. And I believe that that day of redemption is when the body that have died, the physical death, is brought back from the grave and resurrected, redeemed from the corruptible earth to then see the Messiah and the Father. But you know, again, looking at that faith, faith is a, is a spiritual gift that was a given uh, to us by God. He's given us that, that gift of faith, man, you know, and when we operate and walk the walk of faith, when we operate in the faith and walk the walk of faith, who is getting glorified? It is God who's glorified. So James can say, and looking back at the justification of Abraham and looking at Rahab, her justification and her works and the, and, 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 and what uh, accounted uh, Abraham to be righteous in the sight of God, he being justified, it was the faith that did it. It produced the good works of God. It, it made it evident in that person's life that God was working for and through that individual, so they take absolutely no credit. We see the true sovereignty of God there, just right there. God working. 
So that's why James can say again, just as the body, the physical body without the spirit is dead. He shows the distinction. So faith, which is a spiritual gift, is dead without the works of faith working, being produced through the vessel. God is glorified in that. He's glorified. Man, we done took over Nate's stage. We sorry, Nate. We was just <laughs> fellowshipping. <laughs> yeah, you're good. You're good. Yeah, we're getting a Sunday <laughs> service on a Friday. <laughs> Man, it's just, you know, it's just, you know, having that that conversation about him and we try to tell people the reality of Jesus. We can't make them see it. But man, um, it's not something that we would trade. Is there anyone on the stage that would trade the love of God for a million dollars? It's a lot of money. Let's say a hundred million. Would you trade the love of God for that? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Absolutely not. Absolutely. No, you can keep it. Um, there's nothing. Hey, Sint. Go ahead, bro. Sint. I think Sint had something to say. Sure. Yes. Uh, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, grace and peace. Uh, yeah. You know, real quick, I'm at work right now, so I can't be too long. Uh, and I'm glad Pastor Sam is here. I have a question for him, also for you too, as well, uh, Nate. Um, I'll be hearing the other uh, scores between oneness and those who uh, believe in, in, in the Trinity, right? And they go to Psalm 33 and verse 6, which shows, as they say, that God, right, um, you know, all the three persons that uh, represents the Trinity are at work making all things, right? Psalm 33, they say all three have made all things, the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit as well, the maker of all things. But however, when they go to John 1 and 1, to 1 and 3, where it says the Word made all things, there was nothing made that was not made with the Word. But they don't want to say the Spirit could be the one that took on flesh. Why is that? So they go to, again, they go to Psalm 33 and say that the Spirit made all things, but when they go to John 1 and 3, they don't want to say that that word is the spirit that made all things. So it, it just seemed like there is, uh, you know, um, they're just not being consistent uh, in their viewpoints. Because I believe the spirit, because they look. All right, Koshito, have a good one. So if, if they were to say that Jesus is the one who came down from heaven pre-existing well the spirit also came down from heaven pre-existing so i could say the spirit took on flesh is that right because the spirit made all things as you guys say based upon psalm 33 and verse 6 no you could not say no. the holy spirit made all things or became flesh um that's specifically jesus even in john 1 if you keep reading it keeps talking about the word made flesh uh and, or you know the word was with god and the word was god and we know the word is Jesus. The word is the son. And if you keep going down, it says nothing was made through him that has been made. So it's it's specifically like this is one of the things that I mean, unless you just say I'm ignoring all the writing on the paper, you you can't dispute this like it, it's I mean, you can call it lies, I guess, or say it's corrupted, but you can't say it's it's ambiguous. It, it specifically identifies Jesus and says everything is made and sustained through him. Right, but you also, but you would agree that the spirit made things as well, correct? Made all things correct as well, right? I'd need chapter and verse. The only thing that I can immediately think of is in, in Genesis where it says the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep. It never says the spirit made anything. It just says the spirit was hovering over the face of the deep. So if someone wants to, oh. well, no, because when it says all, it means all. So it says, well, here, let's just read it. Let's go to John. Let's just go to John 1 real quick. Yeah. I'll get up my Bible. You know, because in my position, I do believe that right. the spirit. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, hang on, I'm just skimming down through this so I don't have to read like 50 verses. Sure. Yeah, Go because ahead and talk whatever you're saying. Spirit, sure, 
Yeah, yeah, I said go ahead and finish up whatever you're saying. It sounded like you were yeah, saying something no, already. Uh, yeah, because, you no, know, see, my point is that the spirit, uh, I do see the spirit very, very important. Like you said, in the book of Genesis, uh, he's present, hovering over the waters. So he is uh, in creation. To be, uh, he's also play a key role in uh, salvation as well. Uh, the spirit inspired the uh, prophets of old, uh, inspired them to uh, prophesy things of that nature, gave them strength. And, and also the spirit is talking in the book of Acts. So the spirit is very active. So it seems like the spirit uh, is the one trying to make himself known. So I do believe that he is the one who took one flesh uh, and the one who Jesus is representing. So so you wouldn't so you would disagree that Psalm 33 and verse six, the context shows uh, the Holy Spirit uh, is not uh, within that verse. Uh, the Holy Spirit is not in the verse of Psalm 33 and verse 6. Is that correct? Hang on. Let me go to Psalm 33 real fast. Sure. Because I hear, um, um, I Psalm believe 33, it's what? Uh, Albert, uh, Psalm 33 and verse 6. Because Brother Albie, he goes to that verse no, and well, says, well, well, actually, yes, go ahead. Well, I mean, first of all, whenever we're like super reading into stuff, I'm, there's very few hills I'm going to die on. But look at that. It says, by the word of the Lord. Like, and then John 1, it says the word became flesh. So, I mean, it identifies specifically the word. But what we were saying earlier, I mean, it was kind of interesting. I, I wouldn't push back too much on that if you were saying, well, <laughs> like if you don't disagree with John 1, how it says all things, John 1, 3, were made through right. him. Um, so if we're talking about material stuff like that, and you're saying, okay, I believe the Bible, then I wouldn't push back super hard if you say, well, you know, the Holy Spirit inspired people to write the Bible. Therefore, work was produced. Therefore, look, he created something not in the Jesus created and sustains like everything in existence. I would make that really a distinction almost to the point of it's not worth mentioning. But um, if you want to say, yeah, you know, the Holy Spirit, like, you know, gave gave utterance to the prophets, gave them the, the words to say, gave them, you know, the in influence, the inspiration. Then I'll say, OK, well, of course, the Holy Spirit does stuff. But even Psalm 33, verse six, by the word, keep that in mind, by the word of right. the Lord, the heavens were made and by the breath of his mouth and all their hosts. Now let's go to John one. What I was, we were talking about a minute ago. I'm just going to read a few verses. In Sorry. the beginning was the word. So Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord was everything made. John one, right. one in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Uh, in he was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him. So, you know, all means all. And without right. him was not anything made that was made. Right. And then it goes on in him was life and the life was the light of all men and the light shines in the darkness and darkness can't overcome it. And we know in Revelation like 19 or 21, it says the word, uh, the word of God is talking about Jesus in the second coming when he's like right. back in the heavens and everything and talks about the names written on him and everything. And it says, and his name was called the word of God. So from Psalms right. to John to Revelation, the word is Jesus. Jesus made and sustains okay, everything. Okay. All right. So, so from what you just read in John one and one through verse three, uh, where it says there was nothing made that was made, but the word made all things. Right. This whoever this word is, whichever person of the three that, that's Jesus. That's, right. Well, you know, again, well, if we go to Psalm uh, thirty, um, I believe it's Psalm thirty three and verse four, if, if I'm not mistaken, where it says, uh, Job, give the account where he says the spirit of God made me. OK, so either either, you know, is 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 we, we just can't have one person. Right. Making all things in which what you're trying to uh, uh, present what you're saying, Jesus is the one who made all things him exclusively. There was nothing made that was made without that word. OK, so we have to incorporate uh, the spirit in there. Because, again, Job speaks about that, that he was made, okay? And we do understand that the spirit is the breath of life, making things, making things move. So I, I just think that we just can't uh, definitively just uh, show that Jesus is the one who made all things yeah, by yeah, himself. You, you, the spirit you, you, has to be also in the right. picture. And the spirit can be the one who also took on flesh because Jesus Absolutely said not. that these yeah. words are not my words. But, yeah, but I'm being told what to say and how to say it. Yeah, but you're not. Well, absolutely saying, not. Wait. Can, Go ahead, you, Sam. You're not being. You're not being honest with the text. You you you're interjecting what you want to interject. Okay. The the text says both texts that Nate went to say the same thing. The word. Right. John elaborates on it even more and says that the word became flesh. It didn't, it didn't say that the spirit became flesh. 
But even when you go back to Psalms where you were, like the brothers said, it said that it was by the word of God and the breath of his mouth. And that's the Ruha. So so this breath of his mouth would still be the Holy Spirit, like the brothers are trying to tell you, which would be consistent again with John. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Father is God. And so right. well, 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 the Holy Spirit and the Father are two separate persons, correct? Same God? Yes. What are you trying to say? Right. So I'm trying to say is that, you but know, they're one, if but they're two they're separate persons, when you say God, two separate when, persons, well, then two of them. So God. are you saying two came down from heaven? Two persons came down from say, heaven? So how can no. we tell which one took on flesh? No. You're being up take to some purpose. Take the scripture for what it said. It didn't say two came down. The description. Well, the Holy the Spirit. Whole, well, 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 the came, context. If you have Jesus okay. pre-existing, okay, okay he so came good. down, and the Spirit came down after his baptism. So, are you saying two came down from heaven, or one came down from heaven? Right. Pay attention. Pay attention. <laughs> 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 the Holy Spirit, right, <laughs> came down in the form of the dove. If that's what you're talking about. Yes, sir. Okay. That person came down. Yes, sir. The one who's talking okay. in Acts, who says, separate for me Barnabas and Saul for the work I have prepared for him. He came down. <laughs> right. Right. But he didn't come. He didn't come instead of the word. The scripture tells us that the word became flesh. And we can't take that and make that something else, brother. That's That's what I'm trying to relate to you. If you're going to do this, Stay congruent with what the text is saying. The text didn't say that the Spirit did it. The text tells us that uh, the Word did it. But let me do this for you. Let's let's just go ahead and and and, and do this for you. God is a Spirit. Okay. Good morning. Have a good day. So yes. now, I mean, so that doesn't that doesn't change anything. Well, all three of them. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I all three parties are. But, but see, all right, so it says of uh, spirit, but if you go back and look at the text, it says God is spirit. So it, it's not, I'm not trying to to take away from who God is. It is who he is, who he is, he is what his essence is. I've never seen God. You've never seen God. Right, nor have I. Nor right. have I. The description that we have in the word is that the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh. And we see throughout. Right. The and that's just my, that that right. word was that's just my point. Which, which person that, that, that was, that was up there pre-existing, you know, which one of them, you know, took on flesh because again, I mean, you know, the word in John one, one, it doesn't say Jesus and you're right. It doesn't say the no. spirit. Uh, okay. Hang on. Represent... Yeah. 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 Stop. This is, this is painful. Okay. It clearly says that. Let me make one more attempt and then we're going to move on. Cause I, I, sure. I can't. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Okay, let me figure out how to unfreeze my computer. Come on, computer, unfreeze. He froze up your computer. Oh, yeah, there we go. Computer. <laughs> All right, be free. Okay, so the Word became flesh, right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Revelation 19, 13. Let's back up just so there's no ambiguity. Uh, the rider on a white horse. Um, then I saw the heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Remember, that's the guy you're making mad right now. And yes. by the name, and the name by which he is called is, the, say it with me. You know what I'm going to say. The yes, word, the word, word of, of God. God. Yes. And then look at Philippians 2, 6. It talks about how, you know, he, Jesus, being completely equal with God in every way, uh, didn't consider equality something to be taken advantage of. Instead, he lowered himself and took the form of a servant. He became flesh. It says it all throughout the Bible. There's one more, Philippians 2, 6. So he lowered himself, to, took the form of a servant, Jesus, not the Holy Spirit, Jesus. And then Jesus says, I am leaving, so I will send you the one that's coming after me. It will be a comforter. So Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit that's going to come be a comforter after Jesus goes away. So, yeah, we have to be we have to be done. There's no way. I mean, you can okay. leave for right. this well, point, you know, whatever you so want. Much. 
Right. Well, well, thank you so much, Nate. Yeah, you know, appreciate that. But I, I, will, I will just leave with this here. Uh, First Corinthians chapter two, verse 11. No one know the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. So the spirit gets the word first. All right. Well, thank you so much, guys. Have a great day. Yeah, yeah. That, that was hey, a Chris, like what's little up, Chris? left hand lick right there, man. <laughs> well, 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 you know. I mean, if Jesus forgave people, I mean, if Jesus forgave people while they murder him, you know, we can give him the last word to make a little slight. <laughs> but uh, Chris, what's up, Chris? I mean, you know, same old, same old. Heretic's gonna heretic. Yeah, good to see Pastor Sam. Good to see Brother Detroit. Good yeah. to see Brother. you, man. Good to see you. What you rocking on this morning? You on your way to work? I'm eating breakfast. What you have? Good to see you too, Chris. Yeah, man. Um, I am having a grilled chicken feta and olive omelet. Oh, nice. Um, you know, my my uh, parents are in town this week visiting, and uh, <laughs> I don't know why my dad's like Burger King. Like, if if you like, hey, do you want like you know a uh, the, the most amazing five star dinner or anything in between or Burger King? That's what he'll always pick. <laughs> so uh, my wife, <clears throat> she's like, <clears throat> "What do you What do you want to do for Father's Day?" I'm like, "Oh, let's let my dad pick." She, I'm like, "I know what he's gonna pick." She's like, "Oh, well, where do you think I'd like to go?" And she starts naming these really nice restaurants, like seafood, like all this other stuff. Like my parents are not these people. I'm like, I guarantee he's gonna pick Burger King. She's like, "What?" I'm like, "Ask him." I'm like, "I won't say anything." Ask him. He's like, "Where do you want to go?" He's like, "Well, you know, I guess kind of like Burger King." I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> "So um." I don't know what brought that up. Oh, yeah, your feta omelet thing. But, yeah, so our Father's Day dinner is going to be Burger King. Man, that's amazing, man. That is beautiful. <laughs> um, I had dinner with Pastor Mark last night and went to a service. It was fun. You know I'm not a leper, Chris. You could have sent me a text. I mean, he came to Orlando. Oh, never mind. <laughs> I thought you were saying you came here. Who'd you have dinner with? Pastor Mark. Yeah, driving to Orlando. The Pastor Mark is on here? Yeah, the guy down there, Coat Bottom Mark. That's cool, man. That's cool. I, can, I'm time, man. See y I like seeing people in person uh, from... from uh, I grew up in um, Baptist churches, so it was fun to go back to a Baptist church. And, uh, <laughs> what type of church do you attend now, bro? It's non-denominational leaning reform. Did you say non-denominational reform leaning? Correct. I I've never uh, attended one of those before. That would be a treat. Yeah, it is yeah. weird. I've never heard like most most non denominational ones. Or well, you say leaning. Okay, well, I mean may, maybe leaning reform, but yeah. Um, okay, never mind. I mean, we have like Armenian pastors. Like my one of my favorite pastors is a raging Armenian who got his uh, his M Div from Princeton. Does it make you? Uh, probably you're going to say this. Why is Armenian? Does it make you a little? I don't know think a certain way if, if people get their like theological degrees from somewhere other than like, you know, an avowed, like, you know, Christian institution, like, I don't know, it just seems weird. It's like, if you're going to be a pastor, I mean, I mean, there, I guess there would be some sort of acceptable reasons, but it's like, you know, if you go to like, you know, a, a mainstream university, that's not like, you know, a real like Christian university or seminary or focus on Christianity. Um, it just seems like you're going to get like a third rate world, like, you know, wisdom of man type education um i mean presumably if you want to be a pastor you already have the gospel anyway which is you know ultimately what you need i don't know does that does that strike you as weird to get your credentials from somewhere other than like a christian focused institution what do you, so, what do you mean what do you mean nate i'm trying to understand when you well, say like, other than like Princeton. Well, like he was talking about, like yeah, like Princeton, like Princeton School of Divinity or something. It's like you know, it's not a Christian university. Oh, okay. It's very secular. I, I see what you're saying. So it's like, I mean, I'm sure he had, I'm sure he had to like sit through and endure like you know a wide range of like you know uh, world religions and like healing crystal crap, and I, I'm sure he got all kinds of like you know man's wisdom and like other religions that are not Christianity to like you know 
do his dissertation, like, you know, pass his classes and get his credentials uh, versus at a Christian university. There's like, yeah, all that's trash. We're going to focus on Jesus. Let's learn everything about, you know, Jesus and, you know, Christianity and the Bible and that versus, you know, people that are like, I have my doctorate in divinity. Like, yeah. It's like, please give me more manly wisdom. Well, there's no doctorate in divinity, but, um, so Pastor oh, oh, oh Chris, <laughs> I would have, you know, my, my, uh, neighbor has her, her, uh, doctorate in divinity. I will have, you know, uh, I may have to ask her about the school. I think it's somewhere in Arizona, but, um, doctorate of divinity is a thing. You may not like it or recognize it, but the world says it is a thing and she's got one. Usually it's a THC or a DMINJ. Those are the two I'm familiar with. I mean, I'm not saying there's not other doctor programs out there, but those Maybe the THC and the DMIN are the ones that I'm... Yeah, right? But, um, so Pastor Josh has a unique story. He grew up independent fundamentalist Baptist, um, and his dad was an independent fundamentalist Baptist pastor, and he wanted to challenge himself um, and remain in the faith. And so he chose Princeton... A, because he's got like 140 IQ, but B, because he wanted to be challenged on his belief system, and he thoroughly was, and he came out the other side, an evangelical Christian that, you know, still believes in inerrancy. Yeah, and Abba, I'm trying to, I mean, I'm trying to thread the needle a little bit, <clears throat> but I mean, you know, from, from a Christian perspective, um, well, first of all, I mean, you know, any, any like formal you know, worldly recognized education is, is whatever. Like it's not necessary to lead people to faith in Christ under the Christian paradigm. It's, it's wholly unnecessary. So the only, the only benefit I see is just, you know, uh, extra education with increasingly diminishing returns. Like you learn more about history, you learn more about textual criticism, you learn more about stuff. Uh, but you've already, you've already like graduated, right? By the time you enroll in school, you've already graduated, you know, with the ultimate point in Christianity. That, that's what I'm saying. So it's like, if you go somewhere that doesn't have a, a focus on Christian theism, then it just seems like extra diminishing returns. Maybe that still didn't come out right. Maybe I just have a problem with authority, Chris. I don't know. What do you think? I'm pretty sure you do. <laughs> the thing about well, it, I mean, like, to be fair, know, Jesus kind of did too, right? I mean, you know. <laughs> well, you know, except for God is his authority. But, well, yeah, he has the authority, but, um, you know, like the authority, oh my gosh. Go answer that phone for them. I mean, you know, like the authority of man and, you know, people who are like, no, you cannot come into the temple. Oh, you can come into the temple. Oh, I don't know, man's authority, God's authority. I mean, I think you can go to any institution and do well. Like, you know, I guess if I decided to move to New Jersey and go to Princeton, I could probably still come out and evangelical and I would just spend my time arguing with professors. But, you know, I think you can go to any institution and do well as long as you're willing to listen to the stuff that they have to say and then synthesize it with what you are. Well, yeah, it wasn't that you can't do well. Um, I mean, I don't know. It just seems like, uh, I don't know, there, there's a there's maybe a correspondence to fervor. Like, if you're going to be someone very, very passionate and very, very, like, I don't know, John the Baptist-esque or very Paul-esque, um, you're probably not going to come out of some, like, big worldly institution. That, that was all I was trying to say. Clearly, I've missed the mark. Um, it seems like, you know, you'll come out of, like, I don't know, some, like, total Christian seminary at best and maybe out of the woods eating locusts at worst. Um, just preaching repent the end is near. I mean, this is why I read liberal theology is because I want to know what the critique is of my theology. And so if I read liberal theology, it's more useful to understand more about my yeah, that would be one of those valid points I was saying. Like, I'm not saying it's, you know, there aren't good reasons for it. It just seems like, eh, makes me, I don't know, take a second look. And after the second look, maybe I'm like, okay, fine, cool reason, cool story. Uh.
yeah, son, um, it's not that there's one father and two sons. We say that the son is eternally generated from the father and the spirit is spirated from the father and the son. Is he answering chat or is he having this conversation yeah, with someone yeah, at the diner? Sound like he's talking to us. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you talking to someone who you're eating your omelet with? You're like, God is three persons, yet one God. Like, the whole diner's like, bro, we're just eating some eggs. <laughs> Chris, you, you want to wanna explain that? He up at dinner and asked for the three grand slam. <laughs> yeah. No, I was just reading the chat and responding to that. Sorry. No. Oh. Three eggs, three bacon, and three pancakes. <laughs> Calvinists are not so bad when they don't say anything. I guess that's true, but. Man, I'm telling you, man, that brother. He... He he's still in the chat, Nate. He can't help it, man. He's still over there wrestling with <laughs> with the trend. I don't get it, man. Like I I don't. Well, I mean, did it turn into the Trinity? Like from the the Holy Spirit is totally the Word made flesh, even though the Bible like directly con like contradicts that. And then it just turned into the Trinity. Right. And see, you know what? Like oh, there. Like, goodness, we're all over the place. We need to get all these people in a room and just make them sit and listen to each other. <laughs> because we'll have conversations one day that ad addresses what we have the next day with different people and vice versa. So, like, the other day, you know, they were talking about very, very obscure stuff in the Bible. Like, oh, your Bible doesn't speak to this. How can you know? Like, the implication being, oh, your Bible doesn't talk about this incredibly complex subject that has nothing to do with your salvation. Um, and therefore you don't know anything even about the important parts of your Bible that it speaks plenty about. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's fallacious. Um, and now today, we beat the other side of the coin where it's like, well, where does your Bible say this? How do you know this? And it's like, well, here, it says plenty about it. I mean, you know, from Psalms to John to Revelation to Philippians to like the entire Bible speaks a lot about the topic we were talking about today. Um, but now they still find a way to, to I mean, completely to do the opposite of what it says like they're, they're taking the opposite of what it's telling you when there is no uh good way uh, no no way you can mistake this um unless you're just being you know willfully trying so um proof positive people will find a way to do what they want to do no matter what um so you know if the bible doesn't talk about a subject because it doesn't matter they're like oh how can you know anything if the Bible says a lot about a subject, they're like, well, I see a, I see it says exactly the answer to my question I'm asking, but uh, no, it doesn't. I'm like, what? Like, no, it doesn't say what it says. I'm like, so people are going to do what they want to do. Hey, Random, what's up, Random? How are you? Good morning. Good morning, what's on your mind? Not much. I just woke up. Okay. Well, let us know if you have anything to say. So, Chris, any meetings or crawling through attics or anything like that today? No, not today. I got, I got one meeting. It's going to be good fun. We're reprogramming the uh, Counseling Center phone system. Sounds fun. Sounds fun. But I'll be out of here in a few minutes. And I wanted to talk about what's going on with the S. We'll talk about it. What else is going on in the SBC? Is it not painful for me to talk oh, right now? Because of I mean, no one else has, has anything to say, so go What's for it. What's going on at the FCC? The SBC. Yeah, they're expelling churches that have women pastors, from what I'm seeing. Oh, the the Baptist Convention. Oh, yeah. Well, hey, well, hey, I, hey. I ain't mad at them. I mean, I'm not against women being women, but, I mean, you know, it's... Okay, uh, uh, the organization is trying to hold to scripture best they know how. 
and I would rather take my chances with with the women being upset and actually having to face that coming into eternity that I was ordained to women to be pastors, and that's not a biblical premise. It's really just not a biblical premise. I'm not against people, you know, being capable of doing whatever, but, you know, to carry that title pastor is, fact go you don't have to google this you can go and, and, and search your concordance you will not find the statement woman of god in the bible at all it's not there it's a term that we use but it's not a biblical term yep um give me a minute So now I said that I'm not a hypocrite though. I I know some women pastors. I like them. They they, you know, they nice people. <laughs> so if they're like, uh, Pastor Sam, I'm a pastor woman. Um, do you think that's biblical? You would say <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Say, pastor not, Sam, you're you're hurting my feelings. Why are you so hateful and bigoted, Pastor Sam? Like, Why are you well, sexist? Right. But I'm saying, well, what does your Bible say? That that's the only. Yeah. I, what does your Bible tell you to do? See, here's, here's part of the problem that we face. A lot of women are leaving off the description of what charge they have been called to, to try and fulfill the role that God gave to the man. That's a problem. It's a problem. Hey, Israel, what's up? Hey, Nate. How you guys doing? Good. I'm uh, pretty I just got a question. Uh, in the, uh, in the, in the uh, hierarchical uh, rankings of uh, positions inside the church, is a um, is a pastor above a prophet, or can you guys explain that? Is it? I mean, what's the what's the rank? Is it like, is it like a uh, member, prophet, pastor, minister? So is is there some sort of like hierarchical structure that you could maybe explain Wait. to me? So I don't believe my church doesn't have any prophets walking around. No, I mean, I'm talking about in the Bible. So. Oh, in the Bible. Oh, in the Bible. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, I, so, I see. So to compare apples and apples, I mean, oh, Abba's gone. To compare apples and apples, like I don't even know how to rightly do that. Like if you're talking about when there were prophets, um, and then there would be priest. Yeah. So like, uh, uh well, like Levitical priest versus prophet. Like back when when both existed, which would be a higher rank? I don't even I don't think the Bible even does the Bible even talk to that. Like prophet is an office outside of the hierarchical structure of Israel, right? So, like in the church, there are only two positions given. There's elder slash overseer slash bishop, whichever whichever word you prefer, versus deacon. And so, elders would be over deacons, and then there's everybody. Yeah, so like I, I, besides us just like kind of guessing, like I don't think like if you want to take the priest Aaron and compare him to Elijah, like which one carries a bigger smiting stick? Well, I mean, I guess by the works they did probably Elijah, but I don't know if that's a, yeah, there's no real, real biblical way to answer that. I mean, we can guess or have like, you know, Marvel versus Capcom or Godzilla versus Mothra, but um. Anyways, for the actual answer, it doesn't matter because there are no prophets now. So, um, yeah, you've got what Chris said. Okay, I got you. Because, like, it, you know, it talks about, like, uh, Anna, who was the daughter of uh, uh, Luke. Huh? You, you just so, broke up. We didn't... So she, I mean, like, Anna, in the book of Luke, she was a, she was a prophet. And there, therefore... I would assume that she was teaching, that she was a prophesying, that she was instructing people, instructing men. But that, that wouldn't be equivalent to a uh, that wouldn't be equivalent to a, uh, a woman minister today. No, people, absolutely not. Well, well, see, one thing about Israel, I try to you know, we try to tell. I I don't want to use the term you people, but 
to try to explain to you when you, you have you people, Pastor Sam. when you have <laughs> when you have the stance that you have, you you say you're to knock only, but then you start trying to interpret the New Testament from your point of view. You cannot you're not gonna do a good job of it because you're not taking all of what we know, all right? So Jesus ushered in a whole new covenant. With that covenant, he ushered in a whole uh, way of, of teaching, right? So when he's teaching his his leadership, when he was he had the twelve disciples. This was the leadership. These were the people who were going to take the church over when he left, and he told them that. Uh, the world exercises hierarchy over one another. But among you, he that is wants to be greatest will be servant to all. So we're not, uh, our, our, our organization is not, we don't have a hierarchy. We, we share in this that God has given us and the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us and the scripture says <clears throat> in new testament scripture we, he had caused us to set together in heavenly places so no there's no hierarchy and to the thing about you uh, talking about the woman that woman would have been prophesying outside of the new testament or when i say the new testament outside of the, the church realm from what you're talking about in luke that that was not under the the uh, umbrella of the apostles after Christ. Okay, so you're saying that, that there are no more prophets or anything like that? No, I didn't say that. I thought Nate said that. Well, well I, 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 me and, me and I, I don't believe there's any prophets. When, right. when I say, when I, go ahead, Chris, if you, you know, and I can come back, I'm not. Okay, when I say prophets, there are prophets to the church that that are that are for the church age the prophets that you're talking about old testament prophecy that prophecy was intended to bring us to christ and it fulfilled its purpose and now everything that we do as believers is based on that foundation of the apostles and the prophets those old testament prophets and the things they prophesied were fulfilled in christ and our message at the foundation of our message are those prophecies and the the uh, and the testimony of those who walked with Jesus, those apostles. Now, when it comes to like what I said, uh, I'm just going with the scripture says, and I've experienced it. Uh, that spirit that is is in the church. There are people who. Like when the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, when he was uh, going to go somewhere and one of the prophets, he picked up a, a garment of Paul's and said, the person that wears this is going to experience X, Y, and Z. Okay. He wasn't prophesying to the nation, but the spirit of God was on him to prophesy within the church. Those people still exist. I've seen them and they I've seen some genuine people like that, but we don't go I. Okay, let me say we don't go around. Um, it, you know, we're not, well, I can't say what everybody does. The only thing I'm saying is they exist, but it's not like Old Testament prophecy. Yeah. Pastor, you're, you're so cordial with your words, always trying to qualify. You know, and that that's what you need as a pastor as well. You're, you're so careful with your words. I wouldn't say that I'm a continuationist although i do agree i have seen miracles i have seen um i guess not in the same sense as you see in the bible but prophecies be delivered in that sort of sense but we, we don't live in a apostolic age anymore where we do have these people out here healing people um like isaiah was right and, and that's something that also gets me kind of mad when you go into clubhouse and you see all these people named prophetess <laughs> X, Y, and Z, it's like, you would not want to be sawed in half. Like Isaiah did. You would not want to be stoned to death. Like all these prophets were like, that kind of gets me upset, but 
just it, to... it, it's trendy to be an apostle and a prophet. It's trendy. I mean, hey, Apostle Sam. Now, <laughs> we I'm just going to start calling you here. Apostle Sam now. now <laughs> you stupid. I'm not going to take it from you. I take it from the other people. I ain't gonna take it from you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait! I got a better one. A better one, Apostle Mark. <laughs> no, Apostle Apostle True. <laughs> right. That's about the size of it. Anybody in their grandmother can be an apostle now, and if you have the right char charisma, you can get people to follow you and call you apostle and give you money. Hey, I'm telling you. Hey, I'm still offended you ain't got your cash app in your profile. Come on now. I'm going to wait till I get big like you. <laughs> Maybe big around the way. <laughs> so so if there's no more uh, profits and things like that, and, and uh, this is like my uh, final question. I just want to see what you guys think about the scripture. Then Joel 2, 28, 32. I can can pause on that because um, say that again. You broke up. You broke. Up. Okay. So, if there are no more prophets, like like you said, uh, Pastor Sam, there's no more prophets in general, but they're like personal prophets. I think that's what you were alluding to. I can give you some sort of personal prophecy. What do you make of Joel two, twenty eight thirty two? Uh, what, what do you make of that? Like if you read that. How would you uh, explain that or exergete that? Is Joel 2 and what? Joel 2, Joel 2, 2832. Here, I'll just read it, Pastor, and then you can respond. All right, okay. So here's the... And I will be afterwards, it, and it will be afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions, even on the male slaves and female slaves, I will in those days pour out my spirit, and I will put wonders in the sky, on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke, and the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of Yahweh comes. And it will be that everyone who calls on the name of Yahweh will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape, as Yahweh has said, even among the survivors whom Yahweh calls. So, good. I mean, you can respond to that. Pat. Yeah, and my question is, oh, um, has it already happened, or is that a future prophecy? I mean, I believe it's both, but I don't know where Pastor Sam falls. Well, Sam may be at work, so I'll just go ahead and give my answer, and then Pastor Sam can chime in. Just basically... What we see here is a two two tier prophecy. We have one that is uh, the first part of it is fulfilled during Pentecost in the Book of Acts, and the second part of it will be fulfilled. Um, you know, we talk about the great and terrible day of the Lord, or the great and terrible day of Yahweh, is the second coming of Christ, and so um, we are going to see uh, a a different uh, outpouring of how God deals with people uh, in those very last days, um, what, we, what we would call the tribulation as further revealed in the book of Revelation, so the seven-year tribulation. And again, it depends on what eschatology you take. This is why it gets complicated, Israel, is that different Christians are going to have different takes on eschatology. So, you know, my particular take on eschatology is a premillennial, uh, pre-trib take. You're going to have other people that are amillennial, and you're going to have other people that are post-millennial. Um, so there's just, there's a whole mix of theologies and you're going to get a bunch of different answers from a bunch of different Christians. So I just wanted to elucidate that to you, that, you know, my personal opinion is that, um, you know, given the interpretation of this verse, and I've actually studied these verses before, um, 
that the first part of it was carried out at Pentecost the, because it's actually it's actually quoted at Pentecost, right, um, in Acts. Um, and then um, <clears throat> the second part of it where, you know, there's major destruction and survivors and all that stuff, that is a future, that's a far future prophecy. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying. So you, then is that then this doesn't, uh, the, the two uh, events, one where he's pouring out his spirit, and the other the other event where you're talking about, where he talks about uh, destruction, you think there's a separate event and they don't go, they don't coincide with each other. Correct, because we see that, so in Pentecost, right, the, this particular passage is quoted by Peter, right, in his sermon. Yeah, I saw that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. in Acts 2. So, obviously, the world didn't end. You know, we're still here. So, like, you know, there weren't uh, there weren't these uh, apocalyptic events that occurred at that time. And so, you know, the logical idea here is that this would be two separate events. But there are people who take it as one event. There are people that say that the destruction of Jerusalem um, would be uh, the you know apocalyptic events. Um, in this verse. So there are people that are, you know, I'm partial preterist, but there are partial preterists that would take this as a literal fulfillment at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So there you go. All right, Chris, uh, thank you. So for clarity, because part of it didn't come to pass, then it's probably a two-part prophecy. Is that what you said? Yeah, I mean, that's that's one of the views. Um, another view is that it did come to pass at 70 AD. Um, and, and I don't have a problem with that view. I mean, you know, there, there are really good arguments on both sides um, for both views. Um, another view is that none of it has come to pass, which I don't, that doesn't make any sense to me because it's quoted literally by Peter. Um, you know, and then another view is that... Uh, the uh, the end prophecy is for a different event inside of the millennial kingdom. Like that's so th there's there's a bunch of different takes on it. I think that the most reasonable take exegetically um, is going to be either all of it has come to pass or part of it has come to pass. Yeah, I would subscribe to a partial preterist view especially when it comes to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD I do see that I do read Revelation I do see John you know right into an immediate audience in which things are soon to take place for example but you know I, I can be convinced eschatology is one of those doctrinal issues that I, I can just hear debates from all sides and one day, like when I have a bad day, I'm pre-millennial. When I have a okay day, I'm a millennial. When I have a really good day, you know, I'm feeling more more post-millennial that day. So, <laughs> you know, it really depends. Yeah, I mean, and and look, all three of those views are within what we call the pale of orthodoxy. So, you know, people really get hung. If you want to have a really contentious clubhouse room, go take a stand on any of the eschatological positions and publish it out on Clubhouse, and you're going to have 400 people in there, every one of them wanting to argue you to the death. You know, I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. So I, that's, I, I shy away from eschatology for that reason. Um, I really don't think it matters. I think that, uh, you know, future events are going to be happening in the future. That is something that I could care less about because I'm living today in the present. What say you, Rob? Rod. Hey, fellas. God bless you all. Um, I, I'm, I, I would have to chime in with everything you guys are saying. When you can see the view from different positions and all of them have great points, it's one of those where it's not really one you want to die on your dead hill. <laughs> you just say, well, you know, I see what you're saying. This is what I believe. And we all have to be convinced within ourselves of what we believe. But uh, someone said something earlier that I, I heard just last night, and it would it was kind of a difficult passage. Um, it's in Hebrews where um, the writer says that, um, 
how does it go? Um, that is, let me see. Do you know the address, um, brother? I can't even word it right. It's like the scriptures, the, the covenant has not been fulfilled because of, I, I have to get back with you on it. And, and it, it, it's one of those where, like I said, I just heard it last night and it seemed to chime in with the 70 AD when the temple was, uh, was torn down, which allowed for the, um, the New Testament covenant to go ahead and to go into full effect versus someone with, I know you're talking about. So you heard it last night also, given, Pastor. Okay. Mm -hmm. you were not so, I was saying that. Okay, yeah. You were saying? No, I don't think you were saying it. I think Albie no, was, was saying it. I, I thought, thought that was faithful. In our room. I think that was last faithful night. who said that. And this um, guy was in the room uh, making a statement about Hebrews and saying that the New Testament hadn't taken place because uh, he was reading where it says the old is ready to vanish away. And, and Faithful was trying to explain to him that the reason why I say it is ready to vanish away is at the time that the writer of Hebrews was writing, the temple was still standing. And that after the, after the total destruction of the temple, then that would be the end of those uh, ceremonies that went with it. Thank you, right. brother Chris. That was right on time, brother. Appreciate you. That's exactly what I heard last night. And it seemed, it tend to kind of line up with what we were talking about as far as, you know, uh, partial uh, fulfillment. Because when Jesus died on the mm -hmm. cross, the blood was shed. But then 70 years later, I mean, it kind of makes it full effect, so to speak. Well, and <clears throat> I mean, I kind of disagree with a few of the things that I heard last night in terms of the covenant, the Mosaic covenant is broken um, God doesn't break his covenants. Um, God fulfills his covenants. And, you know, there's, n I, I don't see anything in scripture that says the Mosaic covenant is broken. They meant what I see it, is, it, yeah, right? it, so what I, yeah. Yeah. So what I see is that, you know, Jesus by living a perfect life, fulfilled the mosaic covenant in terms of he lived a perfect life and that perfect life is imputed to us so every single one of us is judged according to the mosaic covenant okay because again god doesn't break his covenants so every one of us is judged according to the mosaic covenant the difference with imputed righteousness is that we are judged not on our own fulfilling of the Mosaic covenant, but on Jesus's fulfilling of the Mosaic covenant. And so when God looks at us, this is something called alien imputed righteousness. And what that means is that when Jesus died on the cross and rose again, he took our sins in his body. First Peter two twenty four. he who had no sin became sin on our behalf. Um, second Corinthians five seventeen, And, you know, that exchange, his perfect life for our sin is where our salvation comes from. And so he perfectly fulfilled the Mosaic covenant. And by extension, every single one of us is judged according to the Mosaic covenant and found righteous because we are found righteous with the righteousness of Christ. Does that make sense? It really does. In fact, it's almost tomato, tomato. I know what you're saying in the sense of fulfill versus I done away with. I agree totally with the verbiage that you laid out. I think uh, when people say, um, you know, completed or done away with, they're they're trying to voice or say the same thing you're saying. But there is a difference. I understand what you're saying. But when you do see animal sacrifices have stopped, it's ended. We don't do that anymore. It's like you pointed out. Jesus is our perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God. So it is, it, when it's done away with, you know, you can see it's been done away with. We're not doing that anymore. But, you know, that's where um, the final words that you're using would come into play. So I can appreciate the way you're laying it out. But I think the layman who don't have those big $10 words, which I'm trying to get from you guys, <laughs> I, I, I I don't say there's anything wrong with it. I just, you know, 
I understand people can, they use different terminologies, but I think they mean in the same thing as. Probably. Uh, yeah, and uh, to explore this a little further, because I'm, I'm kind of hearing something different, because yesterday I was in a room with a, uh, a Hebrew Israelite uh, Christian, and he said that, he said that we're not living under the new covenant right now. We won't be under the new covenant until the return of Christ. There aren't any Hebrews. Saying we're already under the under the covenant. I mean, according to the book of Hebrews, that just that's not true. Like I just, I, I mean, right, right. That's what I took, my, I took them to the book of Hebrews yeah. eight and nine. Even eight, even nine says that at the death death of the tester, then the uh, the testament comes in, into effect. So the testator in that uh, instance was uh, Jesus, and Jesus died. So then the, that means that the testament or that covenant would have come into effect immediately. Yeah, what right. a lot of the a lot of the different uh, ideas out there do is they what they do is they go into a private interpretation of scripture per se, which is you guys know there is no private interpretation of scripture. Right. It's not subject to us. I mean <clears throat> like the art and science of hermeneutics is how the Old Testament writers and the New Testament writers understood scripture is that they took it um, literally um, and they, uh, but they still understood the literary devices that are being used. And so we do the same thing. And so when we're trying to, you know, figure out what a passage means, the only correct interpretation is what the author meant by that passage, not you know, oh, this is allegory for this, or we can take this, or there's two different meanings. There are some dual prophecies in the Old Testament, for instance, um, the most famous of which is uh, um, Isaiah, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Isaiah 7, right? The, and the virgin shall conceive and bring forth a child. Um, that's, that's what we call a dual fulfillment prophecy. But what we want, and the reason that is that way is because the New Testament writer shed more light on what that prophecy meant than Isaiah knew. Okay. Right. So, but what, right. Yeah. And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that we're trying to decipher what the author's intent is. So we have to study culture and we have to study, um, you know, context and audience and geography and history um, because those things, as we move further afar afield from the writers of the New Testament and the Old Testament, we have to put ourselves in their shoes culturally and geographically to understand some of the things that they're truly talking about. And so this is why people are studying Second Temple Judaism so much. This is why people are studying, um, you know, the, the culture of the Middle East and, you know, why that's important to understand some of the parables of Jesus correctly. Um, these are all things that we include in a proper use of hermeneutics to understand the scripture. But I do want to point out your first point in more clear, precise way and simply putting that what you said was we must use scripture to back up or explain scripture. Oh, 100%. So the easier passages of scripture, the things that are really clear, we use those to interpret the things that are less clear. And that is one of the rules of proper biblical interpretation. So, you know, Pastor Mark down there um, and I have been teaching a class, pardon me, I've been teaching a class on Wednesday nights on hermeneutics by using Dr. Howard Hendricks' book, Living by the Book. There's a book in a workbook. Um, and it is a really good study on the proper use of hermeneutics. And it's a basic hermeneutics book. If you get past that and you still have some questions, um, one of the other books that I've read that's really good is called The, the Hermeneutics of the Biblical Writers. Um, and that's another really good resource to understand more complex ideas like dual prophecy or the difference between meaning and significance, et cetera. Hey, Chris, is that room on Clubhouse? And you, you, you said you was going to have me invited on this thing. You, why did I mean that? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Pastor Sam. I did want to ask Chris, is that room on Clubhouse that you're teaching? It is. Yeah, so so oh, okay. if you look in my profile or in Pastor Mark's profile, Pastor Sam, I did okay. invite you, man. 
Yeah, but you, even you, you were busy I, sometimes. Center, Rich Young Don. Oh man. Well, <laughs> if I overlooked you, Pastor, I really apologize. I thought I invited everybody. But. Maybe I got it. I did. I didn't. Uh, I did. I may not have recognized it. I'm just messing with you. So it was. Um, it was on Wednesday nights, and I think you're teaching Wednesday nights, like at your church, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's what it was. We were, yeah. That's we what were it was. Yo, yeah, because I remember talking about it, and you were like, "Well, I'm going to be teaching during that time," and I was like, "Well, okay, right. you can't do both." <laughs> so, but I'll try to. Uh, I can still because we're not we're not doing the, the teaching thing now. But uh, so <clears throat> send me an invite Wednesday. Well, this Wednesday is our last session, so I'm late. I'm <laughs> late now. I have to go back and catch those replays. Oh yeah. Yeah, the replays yeah. are really good, and, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, if you start with the first replay, um, Pastor Mark wrote a full curriculum for this for this book that has not been done before. I didn't realize that there were not full curriculums out there to teach through the book in 12 weeks, and Pastor Mark wrote a custom curriculum that you guys can all follow um, by downloading the handouts, and it gives you page numbers and all that stuff, so that on the back end, even though the class isn't live, you can still just benefit from it so he had the uh the pdfs at the top on the link yes sir oh that's cool I, i've done that in another class or two matter of fact i need to go do it now get ready for <laughs> chris you said the hermeneutics by the biblical writers is that what you said uh hermeneutics of the biblical writers by dr david chow Is he, that's is a little he, bit more advanced. That's a pretty academic book. Like that's a that it's a textbook for a master's degree class. Yeah, I I remember Chris, um, you you gave me such a good resource on libertarian free will, love, freedom, and evil. Does authentic love require free will? By that's it is J. Williams, I believe. That was so helpful. So if you guys really do need like good resources on particular particular topics like Chris, he's the man for that. Well, well if I can tell you guys what, what I would like to see to um, Red John Don, one of like... your, uh, I was talking to, to some of your um, Hebrew Israelite Christian brothers. Man, look. And they, they had a totally different, uh, let, me, let me finish. Say, you, you made this statement a minute ago, and I want to make it. Let, really me, let, me, let me finish my question. No such thing didn't, didn't do this. as Hebrew Israelite Christian, it does not exist. Because it, the, foundation, the foundation of Hebrew Israelism is a deception, and okay. the, the Christ foundation cannot be placed at right. a, a deception. So now you can use the term because you're an adult, but I'm letting you know there's no such a career as a Hebrew Israelite Christian. There are only Hebrew Israelites, which you are one of them, and all y'all go together in the same part. No, I'm not a Hebrew Israelite. But listen, though, I was saying, I was talking to one of your Hebrew, because, you know, I don't accept the uh, New Testament. I, I, I just want to have a dialogue. I don't want to get into contention. I was What I was wanting to state was I was talking to one of your Hebrew Israelite Christian brothers, and I would like, I was wondering if you guys could have a like a debate talking about Hebrews 8 and 9, because the, he was under the impression, and I, and I agree with you guys. I, I was, even though I don't accept the New Testament, I said that according to the New Testament, then the new covenant would have taken effect immediately upon the death of Christ because uh, he was the testator. And so the, the covenant, the, uh, the, the covenant, I mean, sorry, the testament, testament or, or the covenant would have come into effect after his death or therefore, or almost immediately after his death. I don't know how that really works, but it wouldn't be thousands of years later. And because he said that they're waiting that now the Christians are waiting for Christ to return to enforce the new covenant. But uh, I, I, didn't, I disagreed because according to the, what the scriptures read, and it was plain as day for me to see it. And I was wondering why he couldn't see it. So, and I, I, and I told him, I said, you, you are going against, you know, a myriad of your Christian brothers. And he said, well, he didn't care because you guys didn't know what you were talking about. So I was wondering, mm -hmm. like, if you guys start a room and uh, invite. Well, like, who, who are these people. cats, man? Like, I mean, I, like, I know there's Joel a bunch of Hebrew and, Israelites. Joel, like, Joel, I know... and, it was Joel and uh, they're the, the Sons of Thunder. And Pastor, you yeah. know these guys, right? Joel. Yeah, I know because I know they hate me. 
Yeah. You know, Joel is a Hebrew Israelite? Yeah. Well, I'm he's confused. A, I didn't know, I I didn't know Joel. Of of no, Joel resurrected. What? He calls himself resurrected. Oh, it's a different oh, oh, no, guy. It's another Joel. Joel okay, I'm okay, thinking of him. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I just yeah, don't exactly. know these guys, dude. So, like, I mean, if you want to get them in a room somewhere, like, you'd have to ping them in because I don't even know who these guys are. Pastor, you're friends with them, right? Uh, we're not friends. We are associated uh, on here. That's what I mean. I mean, you know them. So, I'm, just, I'm, just even, curious. I'm not even sure if he's following me anymore. <laughs> I mean, I, I definitely follow you because, Pastor, you know, you're my boy there. Yeah, we're I mean, not boy. You're, you're, the, you're I got a good you. guy. We're pretty cool, though. <laughs> when we get off these other platforms, I, I, I like you. I really do. You, you. Yeah, same here. But here's, here's one of the things that's funny about you, is, uh, uh, brother True. You can see the scripture and how plain it is in the New Testament. Yet you will not submit to Christ. It's an amazing thing. You're gonna miss out on the love of God trying to uh, 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 get to heaven on your own, brother. And so I just continue to invite you to submit yourself to the love of God. That's the only thing that's going to save you. I mean, I really I appreciate that. But, but I really, to be honest with you, I really do feel the love of God. And it's not. I can see it. Well, it's, it's not. It's, well, yeah, it's David not for his people. It's not a feeling. <laughs> I guarantee you that. Uh, uh, unless you experience the encounter that comes from true repentance to God, through Christ Jesus, you haven't experienced the love of God at all. That's what that's what Jesus told Nicodemus, because Nicodemus thought he felt it too. And he said, you, you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. You haven't been born again, sir. So whatever you're feeling, that's nice. But you're going to have to repent. You're going to have to see the need to repent from rejecting Christ. If you don't see the need to repent from rejecting Christ, my friend, as much as we are uh, have g great camaraderie, I have to tell you, you will die in your sins. Amen. Well, well thank you, uh, Pastor. Yeah, because I, but I do repent. I repent when I sin, when I fall. And uh, I do have a sense of forgiveness from the Father. But um, again, I, I thank you guys for letting me come up. I'm going to bow out now because uh, I, I actually when I came in here I just I want to cool down a little bit because I just finished cutting my grass. Um, you know when you get there's no when you get old it's, it gets more and more difficult. <laughs> that's, when so, um, hire, that's when you hire somebody, true. You know, that's how you that's how you stay in shape, Pastor. That's how you stay in shape. You got to get out there and do it. Oh well, yeah, I get that now. I'm not going. You know, you know. You know, you know how many men in their fifties die from cutting their grass? It's a lot. <laughs> I know it's even worse. Men in their sixties, <laughs> it's <probably laughs> even worse for guys like me. But uh, I take my chances because uh, you know, because I, you know, I, I want to enjoy a good hamburger every now and then. <laughs> Y'all almost scared me because I'm in my fifties and I cut my grass. Now you're making me rethink. No, 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 keep doing it, brother. Yeah. I'm in my Just 60s. go to your doctor and make sure you ain't got no blockages. All right, that's what I wanted to hear right there. Keep doing it, brother. You, you'll, you know, I'm in my 60s and I still do it. So, you know, once you stop, I, I think that then you, you'll probably quit. But anyway, guys, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. You guys have, have a great day. God bless. The brother he had brought up a good point. Uh, as far as the Hebrew Israelites and their discussions of trying to make it uh, a church. I like something that uh, the pastor or one of y'all have responded to him with. It's, it's uh, they're not the church. Even if they were trying to maintain, say, uh, Romans 11 as Israel, Israel and then the Gentile church. I don't know, but from what I can see, it is there are differences. We're not a replacement theology, or do y'all agree with that? Yeah, I reject replacement theology. Hey Amen. I feel like I'm in in good company. So what what what's the difference between replacement theology and covenant theology? That's a really good question. 
Nate, I feel like you just haven't said anything in like an hour. I know, I'm banging my head against my keyboard. I'm trying to do some work. And I don't know, man, it's hard. Like, you know, when you guys talk about like deep stuff, I just sit back and listen because, you know, if it's not like something super like, you know, your God's a lie and he's also evil. I, I don't know. There's certain things that like hit my triggers for things I want to talk about. Um, this stuff, I'm just like, yeah, kind of like you and eschatology, right? It's like, you know, I have my kind of kind of views of it, but, you know, take it or leave it. You know, some of it could not be correct. Some of it could be. Um, doesn't matter, right? Like, as long as we have Jesus and we're on the right side of this thing, it doesn't matter what happens. Um, you know, I'm not going to be like, oh, I was wrong about that. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I have eternal life in Jesus. I don't care about that stuff. Um, so, you know, I, I happen to think pre-trib, rapture, things like that. You know, millennium... <clears throat> The new heaven and new earth. <clears throat> Are we? One moment. Let me die. This is also why I've been on mute a lot. <clears throat> you get to hear that one. So it's like you know. Are we? Are we temporarily spirited away while this earth is cleansed by fire and then it's regrown and we're like put back here on this physical earth, reborn? Or is it a new earth that comes in like skin suits this one and wraps over it like a car cover, uh, like vinyl? Um, or are we just straight up in, in heaven in some way else the new new heaven, new earth makes sense? I don't know or care. Um, I'm where Jesus is. That's all that matters. And then if we want to say, well, technically for a thousand years, Jesus is somewhere else. And we're, I, I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> I have eternal life. I'm good. Anyway, yeah. that's, that's why I've been kind of quiet. Fair. So the difference between replacement theology and covenant theology, um, it depends – uh, wholly on what you determine the church is. So in the Roman Catholic um, idea, the church is an institution over and above the individuals that make it up. Okay. And so uh, the church itself is a replacement for Israel in the Roman Catholic sense. And this is where you get replacement theology is that the church as an institution replaces Israel and that the true Israel or the Israel of the heart, as Paul talks about in Romans uh, 10 and 11, uh, is found within the, the church. The problem is, is that that's a, in, in the Protestant view, that is an incorrect view of what the church is. The, in the Protestant view, the the church is the universal church made up of all believers on the earth right now. Um, it is not an organization or an institution over and above the individuals that make it up. Um, and so covenant theology simply means that um, the, the members of the covenant, i.e. believers, make up what is called spiritual Israel. And I have no problem with that because there's no there's no replacement of the nation of Israel. It is simply the description of what it means to be in the new covenant and specifically as Gentiles engrafted as wild branches, as is talked about in Romans 11. And so, you know, the the difference between covenant theology and replacement theology is what you determine is the nature and character of the church itself. Did that question get answered? Yes, was... yes, it was. <clears throat> All right, I just realized the time. Gosh, time flies when I'm steeped in work and it's awful um well everyone <laughs> i suppose you all have you have something to you have somewhere to be right chris yep or mr i'll be down there i don't know it seems like you guys are having a good little club pastor sam anyone want to keep this thing going i have to take my family to uh an early lunch yeah we'll keep it going all right well take care let me know how it goes and good to talk well, good to listen to some of you guys and we'll catch you later all right. Have a great day, man. All right. You too. See ya.